Amen. Hey, uh, this morning, uh, Pastor Josh is going to come and share with us, and it's been about a year, so he just might explode when he gets up here, so I just want you to know that. So, uh, listen, we are very fortunate to have Josh and Marissa, and they just celebrated their sixth wedding anniversary, so <laughs> congratulations. And Marissa, I don't know how you've done it. I don't know how you've done it. But uh, we're so glad that they are here. And uh, so would you give Josh a good hand as he comes and shares God's word this morning. Hola. Hola. Just kidding. Como estas? Muy bien. De donde North Carolina. Estudio religión. Yo estudio, I don't know, church. How are you guys doing? Y'all good, man. I'm so excited to preach this word. I feel like I've been uh, gift wrapping a Christmas present, and I'm about to give it to you guys. So, man, uh, just God's going to move today. Amen? God's going to move. He's going to break some things, break some chains. So, uh, just wanted to mention that. Hey, let's pray. Let's pray before we go into the Word. God, we love you. We want to start this Word with you. We want to finish this Word with you. We want to start this day with you. We want to end this day with you, God. Lord, there's no part of this service that we don't want you in. Lord, you are welcome, Holy Spirit, to do whatever you want to do. God, change us, shape us, transform us. Do what only you can do, God. Love on us today, God, with a holy hug. In Jesus' name, say amen. Hey, I'm going to be honest. I feel like our church is not in uh, remission. I feel like we're in revival. Can I say that? I feel like we're in revival here at our church. Now, I'm not speaking something that God's given me for. I just, I feel passionate about the next generation. They say that the most two important dates in a teenager's life are these. The day that they were born and the day they find out why. And I am passionate about telling the next generation why they were born. And there's a generation of young people that are rising up that God is saying, I want you to find out why. So the devil better better be scared. Amen. So I feel like we're not in remission, we're in revival. So I feel like we, we need to start with that. That We look to Joel, uh, you know, in the Old Testament that said, I will pour out my spirit, and that's all I'm asking for today. So I just wanted to start with that, that kind of, that, that thought. So there was this uh, job in a uh, position that opened up in the early, maybe 1900s, uh, when the paper company was on its brink, and man, dozens showed up for this job. It's nerve-wracking. Papers are flying everywhere. Papers are being shuffle, shuffled off of desks. People are, are, are angst and, and anxious, and uh, the telephones are ringing, and uh, people are just kind of on edge because this job interview is so important because, I mean, people were in recession. I mean, there, there's, there's a depression. I mean, like, there's so much stuff going on. All of a the sudden, there's this line of people. All of a sudden, this guy leaps to his feet and bolts into the manager's office. Now, that's usually how you not get a job. Like, that's not a good start to the day. Like, usually you don't do that. You wait until you're called on. This guy didn't care. Runs into, uh, runs into the office. And about after five minutes, everybody's like, you know, whispering and talking like, what was that guy thinking? Like, what was he on? Is he on medication? Like, should he be here? Like, did he escape? Like, what is happening? The manager comes out and says, hey, I'm sorry, everybody. Just quiet down real quick. Uh, The position has been filled, and uh, I'm sorry, but you guys can go home. Bye. And everybody's like, are you kidding me? And he goes up to the guy who got the job, and they're like, what did you, what did you, uh, what happened? Like, what did you do? What did you say? And uh, the guy's like, didn't you hear it? Hear what? I mean, it's, there's so much commotion, so much chaos, so much just, just hecticness. And uh, he says, didn't you hear it? See, I have a military background. And in Morse code, I heard, if you want this job, proceed into my office immediately. And that's how I got the job. And they're like, what? Are you kidding me? And I want to start with that story because in the midst of a bad situation and the the odds were stacked up against him and it was stressful and it was chaotic in the middle of a, a maybe a pandemic, in the middle of sickness and recession and depression, there was still a guy who could hear the voice that was needed to come for him. There was a message that he needed to interpret. And that's my message today. Can you hear the voice of the Lord? Can you hear his voice? Revival means an improvement 
in the condition or strength of something. Something becoming active or important again. So my sermon title today, if you're taking notes, get out your phones, do whatever you got to do watching online. The recipe for revival. The recipe for revival. Revival means becoming active or important again. To restore consciousness and bring back to life. God wants the church to wake up. God wants the church to wake up from its slumber. I love how the Bible says God's mercies are new every day. Or every morning, some translations. I love that. That's great. Hey, praise God. But, but what about the nighttime? When it, it always confuses me. God's mercies are new every morning. And it's like, well, what about at 3 a.m. when I can't sleep and my baby won't go back to sleep? Like, what about that time? Like, where is his mercies there? And I don't really want you to think of God's mercies as a time in the morning. I just want you to think of God's mercies as a time when the church wakes up from its slumber. God wants to wake us up. He wants to improve the condition of the church. He wants to strengthen the church. He wants to grow the church and revive the church again. Farming is tough in areas that lack fresh water. It causes a serious uh, decline in the crops until, someone say until, until something new was created. They are called cooling houses. They leave salt water behind and they use salt water to kind of cool. There's panels that go along it like in a greenhouse. It's a cooling house and it leaves the salt behind and it cools the crop and it leaves for a great environment for crops to flourish. It sounds like a lot like when God ref refreshes us and revives us when we're dry. We start to feel dry like a crop without fresh water. Then suddenly, remember suddenly in the Bible, there's so many suddenlies. You, that could just be a sermon of itself. Since suddenly like a new creation, God does something new. And how many of y'all want something new? Like I need something, I need something new, something fresh in my life. Then we leave our mark on culture like the salt that comes behind. And then our lives and the lives around us flourish. Bible says that we, our lives will flourish like a palm tree. Let me bring you on a little secret. Revival isn't just so that the sinner finds faith, but so that the saint finds freedom. Because when, when we think of revival, you're like, that's great, get people saved. But what if I'm already saved? No, it's not just so that the saint finds uh, faith, but so that the, the saint finds freedom. This is what revival looks like. Prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Miracles take place. The cynical find faith and the dead come to life. If you want that to happen, I want you to give God a hand clap right now. Let's just usher in his presence. Let's usher in that, that praise. God, we want you to do it. The other day I'm at the gym. And uh, it's a normal day in our gym. We, we kind of do like different sessions. And uh, so I showed up. Very normal. Very mundane day. Like, probably was fearing, like, a, like I, I was about to hate my life going to the gym. Anybody, like, you're there, you're like, I'd rather just go home and eat pizza. Like, <laughs> let's be honest. We get there. It was going to be a PR day on the treadmill. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Like, Jesus be with you. I'm, like, doing Hail Marys. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm doing, I'm covering all the denominational stuff. I'm like, God, you got to help me. Uh, a couple of minutes into the workout, you hear the trainer over the, over, the, over the intercom say, treadmills, I want you to shut it down. Shut it down right now. I thought she was just playing. I'm like, lady, once I get going, like, I can't stop. Like, I, I'm trying to PR today. She says, treadmill, shut it down even louder. I'm like, okay, you got it. Like, it was, shut it down. I look over, and there's a guy convulsing that has fallen and hit his head on a weight or a machine, and he's falling there. He's breathing really heavy, and this guy beside me looks like he's in the military or he's a doctor or something. He rushes over to the guy. I'm like kind of shaken up and I feel like, like I'm a pastor, like I probably should be doing something about now. Like what should I be doing? Should I be stretching my hands? God, we, it's a secular environment. I'm like, they don't want that here. Like what's going on? This is a true story, by the way. He's convulsing and everybody's freaking out. I mean, the trainers, this is not a normal day for them. This isn't like teaching people how to do like an ab crunch. I mean, this guy, this guy's breathing heavy. It doesn't sound good. So uh, if you weren't helping him, you went outside. I went outside. So, so I'm outside, and literally right there, uh, I think it's Village Square on Thomas, uh, Thomasville and Orange Theory Fitness, there are like 30 of us outside. And I'm just like, 
this is the craziest thing. Like, what? I just wanted a PR, and the guy had to go and have a heart attack. Like, really? No, I'm just kidding. I'm like, I really should be doing something. And I'm just like, but I don't have the courage to start it. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I don't feel brave. Like, in front of you right now, like, I can just seem really brave. I was just, like, feeling like a coward. And uh, this lady, she turns, uh, she turns over, and she's just like, does anybody pray? And I was like, that's my cue. And I said, I pray. And I said, what's his name? And they told me his name. Let's say his name was Josh. And I was like, Father, in the name of Jesus, literally in front of like 30 people, was like, God, I want you to touch Josh. I was just praying all sorts of things. It was right around Easter, Pastor. So I even prayed for resurrection. I was like, God, resurrect his body. Touch his legs, God. When he gets back to the gym, he's going to work out like he's insane, you know. And I'm praying in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody's like, that was a great prayer. Like, are you Pentecostal? Are you crazy? (laughs) And like I said, I said a couple of things. I was nervous. I was sweating in a secular environment. I'm like, what is going on? I didn't tell them I was a pastor just in case the prayer, like, sucked. And then then they wouldn't know. (laughs) Still haven't told them I'm a pastor. I'm like... And then I start feeling, I should shepherd this moment. Like, I should pastor this moment. Like, I should be going around. People are angst. I'm going around. I'm talking to people. I'm like, hey, so you know the guy? Like, and, I mean, ambulances are coming. Like, fire trucks there. Like, the whole nine yards. And uh, I'm feeling so dumb for praying for resurrection. Like, it was crazy. And, uh, anyways, the guy gets uh, carried out on a gurney. When they put him in the, uh, in the car or in the ambulance, they don't turn on the sirens and head off. That's usually not a good sign. And uh, still, didn't have the courage. I'm, I'm sorry. Didn't have the courage to speak life again. And God, this lady said, hey, Josh wants to pray again. I said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I collected myself in literally like family style. We held hands in an Orange Theory Fitness gym with 30 people around. Like we were about to grub on some fried chicken. And I grabbed hands and I said, Father. And turned to find out there was a doctor there also. And you know what the doctor was saying? She was like, I'm so shaken up because he died. And I was like, God, I don't feel dumb for praying for resurrection anymore. And I literally held hands and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you've given us a doctor that's shaken up and you've given us a pastor that's prayed up. But Lord, I just pray, Lord, that right now, God, he would feel your touch. God, he would feel your anointing, God, that he would have the power of the Lord to raise him up. And I was like, God, before he even took his first conscious breath this morning, you gave him a doctor, you gave him a pastor, and Lord, we're going to do it up. And literally, God resurrected him. He's doing great. He's doing awesome. It's like, wow, who would have thought in a secular world like that opportunity would come, come up, shaken up pastor, or shaken up doctor, prayed up pastor. That's all it takes, just partnering with the king of kings, and that's what revival is. It's for part- partnering with the king of kings so that we can see the poorest zip code in Florida receive the richest blessing of the Holy Spirit. They say you can tell a lot, uh, uh, tell if a tsunami is coming uh, when you encounter these three things. I got to hurry. An earthquake. The longer the shaking, the more powerful it is. The sudden change in the tone of the ocean. A quiet sea that becomes rough. The water recedes dramatically and drastically. The quicker it goes back, the quicker it's going to come in. And a loud noise. The louder the roar, the bigger the surge. In the past two years, we've seen a lot of signs. But I don't know if it's been signs and wonders. It's just been sins and no wonders, right? We've seen God shake those inside and outside the church. For some, the pandemic pushed people over the edge, and they never came back. For some, the pandemic pushed them deeper into faith, and they never looked back. For some, there's been changes in the tone and the words in our post. Something happens, and we feel nudged to say something. They expect a statement. We say something, but it's not what they wanted. They expect an apology. We've seen God pull back the curtain of some things in our life like an ocean. And we used to uh, be able to coast of what, what Pastor Brian says in a sermon, but now we've got to find it out ourselves. We used to be able to hide in the cheap seats in the back. I'm talking to you guys. And come late and leave early. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Leave early. But we've got a roar uh, from the shout of the forces of darkness and an assault on the church. Check this out. More of you guys have seen this. More college students are celebrating the deconstruction of their faith than the celebration of their faith. 
More teener, teenagers are questioning their God-giving sexual orientation and identity than ever before. Uh, stress is on the rise. Depression is on the rise. All these things. Like evil has been making an assault on the church. Remember Mike Tyson the other day? Gets up, and I don't know if that guy, like, knew he's, like, the baddest man on the, on the planet still at 55. Turns around, starts wailing on this guy because he had been agitating him and harassing him and trying to humiliate him. Guy ends up bloody and bruised, and, man, blood, sweat, and tears went all over that guy. Why? Mike Tyson responded. What's our response? What's our response to the devil? What's our response to the evil in this world? If there's ever been a time for revival, it's what? It's now. What are we waiting for? Things have gotten pretty bad, but I believe that all the while, if you'll believe it with me, like a tsunami, God is about to bring a wave of revival in our church. God is about to bring a wave of cleansing in our nation. He's going to empower our church, touch our children, touch our, 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 our church, and heal our world until he comes. If God is coming back for a spotless bride, then he's been getting the spots out. If God, if God is coming back for diamonds and not dirt, then, man, he's been putting us under the fire. Man, my lawnmower broke down recently. <laughs> Crazy. Like, if that ever happens, like, it just, it doesn't look good. Like, my house, it looked, it used to have a really great curb appeal. I mean, it looked like Julio was just over there, like, every single day. It looked, like, high and tight. Like, it was just awesome. It looked great. Like something out of Disney World, I'm telling you. Like, I just, my edges were so straight. I would just work so hard just getting that weed eater down there. It was awesome. Now, it looks abandoned. Our place, don't drive by. It looks terrible. Seems like I've given up. Seems like I don't care. Since then, I've become one of those dads that water his grass. You know, I've got my blue shorts on with my tube socks. Literally, I have tube socks on. And I've got my white Nikes, and I'm out there, babe, I'm watering the grass. It's got to grow, honey, okay? I'm going to fill this spot. It's going to be great. Bring in some sod. It's going to be great. I've become one of those dads. I said, I'm going to water the front yard, the backyard, the side yard. I can't control how, it, how much it's going to grow, but I can control how much water I'm going to give it. And I just felt God in that moment say, control what you can and what you can't give to me, right? And I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we're going to believe that sons and daughters are going to come to faith, that young men will have visions, that, that sons and daughters will prophesy, young men will see visions. It's going to be awesome. Habakkuk 3, bet you never heard this verse. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, in wrath, remember mercy. I don't want to miss the wave of revival. Since our invite night in GC Youth, we've had over 20 first-time guests. 20. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. That's awesome. I texted Bo. I said, Bo, how many people you got over there? I've been seeing your stories. I mean, it's packed. There's so many kids everywhere. He said, man, we've had 18 salvations in GC Kids in like the last couple of months. That's awesome. <laughs> praise God. I'm not just speaking on a whim here. I really do think that there's something in our church. I've gotten to the point in my ministry where I'd rather preach to 20 people who are hungry than 200 people who are full. I've gotten to the point in my sermon preparation where I want to do more preaching to me than I do preaching to you. I want to preach consistently good than occasionally great. I've gotten to the point in my witness where I don't care if I'm the one watering the plant or I'm watching the plant grow. I just want to be a part of what God's doing. After all, I haven't heard a trumpet blast, and I'm pre-trib. So if we're still here, then God still has a plan for the church. And God said, that my, my, my ch I'll build my church on the gates of hell, and they, they'll, they'll not be able to do anything about it. He said, I'll build my church. God's going to use us. He's, well, uh, the church is still a business. The church is still essential. It's still the instrument that God's using. So we know what God's response is. What's our response? What are we going to do? We've seen some healings. I've seen some people, Glenn, I heard, I heard you up here talking about how God touched your shoulder. I had labrum soldier, shoulder surgery too, and I was like, man, that's, that's some stuff, that's some pain right there. But God's been touching people. You've been seeing, remember, uh, uh, this is my story Pastor Brian talked about on Easter, and we've been doing the, the, the series about people's stories, telling your story. We've had some great services. We've seen some great miracles. But it's time to see who wants to have God moments and who wants to see a God movement. I mean, to see a God movement. Many of y'all don't even know what a great awakening is because it's been so long since our nation has seen one. First great awakening, second great awakening. Uh, the, the Jesus movement, the Sunday school movement. And uh, man, just so many great movements. 
So here it is. I got to hurry. The recipe for revival. There was this girl when she was 12 years old by the name of Kirstie James. True story. She had trouble seeing, uh, but she shrugged it off. When she got older, though, it started to bother her. She thought that she was losing her mind because she would start to have visions and hallucinations and things wouldn't be as if they were. She would go to the store for coleslaw. She'd come back with a steak. I mean, like, she thought that cars were buses. She thought that the ground beneath her was moving. She thought she was losing her mind. I mean, you can imagine how scary that would be. She started going to clubs and raves and parties because people are usually drunk there or on drugs. So she would, if she did stumble and fall, it, no one would notice. She thought she was losing her mind because one time her mom walked past her in the street and she didn't even recognize her. She went to the doctors. The doctor says, Kirsty, have you ever heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome? It affects people losing their sight and it causes the brain to replace images with visions because it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing. Get this, her response says, I, I just cried and said, so I'm not going mad? He said, no. She said, I remember feeling this huge relief that I didn't have a mental health problem. I didn't have an eye, I just had an eye condition. And I love that story because she said, I thought I was losing my mind, but I was only losing my vision. And number one, if we're going to ride this wave of revival, we got to fix our eyes. You just gave a word on that. I felt that over there. Lift our eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I don't know that because I've read the Bible. I've just listened to casting crowns, right? I know that. <laughs> Proverbs 29, 18 in the KJV. Here we go, old school version. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Wow. But he that keepeth the law, keepeth. Keepeth, okay, I got a theology degree, keepeth. And the law, happy is he. When Disney World was first opened, Miss Walt Disney uh, was asked to do the ceremony because Walt had died, and someone stood up and said, Miss Walt Disney, I just wish Walt could have seen this. And she stood up, and she grabs the mic, and she says, he did. That's the power of vision. That's the power of vision. If we're committed to seeing God shake the nations, you won't have to tell me your schedule will. I read this article that talked about the five reasons why uh, adults don't go to church, I mean sporting events anymore. Here we go. Y'all are going to love this. Some games go into overtime and extra innings, and I was, get, I was late getting home. The referees were always making decisions I didn't agree with. Like I said, this is about sports. This is not about church. The coach seemed to favor other players and never showed me any attention. The people sitting on my row didn't seem really friendly, and they never talked to me. And lastly, my favorite, every time I went, they were just asking for money. Like, that was what they were doing. I'm only kidding. But if you read Nehemiah chapter 8 that talks about when they just read from the law, Ezra, for like six hours a day, every day, from like morning, uh, you know, until the afternoon. It says that God poured out his spirit like none other. People were, literally read it, Nehemiah chapter 8. And then when you read Luke talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he talks about one thing, assembling together. That's why Paul said, don't, don't forsake assembling together. Why? Because when you get together, man, that's when you, you know, when a, when, when a lion's hunt, uh, you know, you'll see a wildebeest kind of straggle off on a lawn. And that's when they become susceptible to attack. One accord, together. A neuroscientist did a study to see if an article's headline could convince people to think a certain way. He gave a certain volunteers uh, the same paper, the same material, uh, with the same wording, except the title was different. One said, number of burglaries going up, and the other one said, number of burglaries going down. He asked them to write a short sum uh, summary about it, and man, the, the, you know, like he expected, the perceptions of what they were given were different based on the headline that they were given. I wonder if your life isn't a bad book. You've just given this chapter the wrong title. When I have vision, I feel like li that I'm living life. When I don't, I feel like life is living me. Anybody? When I have vision, I feel like I tell God how, how, about my problems, and then when I don't, I tell my problems about God, like, or a flip-flop. You got to fix your eyes. There was this man who, uh, who used to be an actor. He was kind of down on his luck. He was struggling. His name's Daniel, and uh, he was looking for an acting job. And uh, he was barely getting by, just straggling by, and uh, ends were barely meeting. He sees an ad in the paper about playing a gorilla. And he's like, well, I've never done that. 
but sure. Like, I'm tired of eating ramen and eggs and ice cubes. Like, here we go. Like, so, so he barely looks at the ad. He tears it off out of the newspaper, and he goes to the address, and when he gets there, he realizes it's the zoo. <laughs> He's like, are you kidding me? He realized the zoo is looking for a gorilla. I'm not a gorilla. Like, what's going on? My name's Daniel. Like, I'm down on my luck. He said, well, we've done a lot of capital improvements here and investments, and, and we don't really have the money to, uh, to, 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 to buy an actual gorilla. True story. For, so for a period of time, we want you to play gorilla. We want you to go ape. Some of y'all get that later, whatever. So we want you to do gorilla things. We want you to jump around. Like, it's going to be great. So for a period of time, he does that. And at first, it's like, great. I mean, the kids are loving it. They're like, oh, my God, honey, come and look at this. He's right by the glass. I mean, looks like he's doing jumping jacks. Like, what is he doing? He's putting his hand on the glass. You've been to the Jacksonville Zoo or wherever. Like, you've seen the monkeys. And sometimes they do things that do look like humans. So it's not really that kind of a far stretch of imagination. He's in a nice gorilla suit. I mean, like, the nicest you could, you could get. Kids are loving it. He sees this rope that a, uh, a swing that another gorilla, I guess, when they had a gorilla, had used. And then he jumps up on this tree, and all the kids are like, oh, my God. You know, dads are like, honey, look at this. This is great. And he's swinging on this rope, can you imagine, in the middle of the zoo. And, uh, man, his hand slips when he's, when he's twirling in the air. And he falls, and he lands into the exhibit next to him, which was the lion cage. <laughs> he lands in the lion cage, and immediately... He's like, hey, I'm human. He takes off his mask. He's like, I'm Daniel. I'm not, I'm not a gorilla. And all of a sudden, there was this lion that ran over to him and pounced on him. I mean, you can imagine his heart's racing. He's sweating blood. I mean, this is not good. And what he does, the lion uh, uh, leaned over in his ear and said, man, will you shut up? You're going to get us both fired. <laughs> True story. No, nah, I'm just kidding. It's not a true story. But I think the point behind it is that if we're going to ride this wave, we got to stop pretending. Got to stop pretending. Ephesians 4.25, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, speak truthfully to his neighbor. I got another secret. God can't heal who you pretend to be. If you keep this up, you won't be the one wearing the mask. The mask will be wearing you. During the height of the pandemic, Brent worship team, you guys can come up. Uh, I, I had to run to Target. We were doing some kind of color war, some, something youth ministry or something. I needed to go find balloons. I think we were having like a 10,000 water balloon challenge. It's always so funny. I'm a part of this youth, youth pastor's page, and you'll just see some of the stuff they purchased, like at Sam's. And it's like a guitar, a shark tattoo, you know, a pool noodle. It's like you never know with youth ministry. So I run over there on Wednesday. It's hectic. I'm, I'm always running late, so I'm over there, and I, I get to the door, and there's this big strapping guy. It looks like he plays for Florida State, and he's over there. He says, hey, you can't come in here unless you have a mask. And I was just like, ah, and I wasn't like against masks or anything. I just forgot, right? I just forgot. You know, many of you have done it. You're just like, dang, forgot it right in the car. Before you come in, like, it's policy. Like, you can't even come in here. And I wonder how many times before we've went to church, before we've stepped into the spotlight, before we've led our family, before we came home, got to put on that mask. I got to pretend to be something that I'm not. But let me tell you what, God can't heal who you pretend to be. He wants to heal the real you. God's not in love with a future version of you. He's not in love with a, a, a better version of you or a better looking version of you or a more, a, you know, intelligent version of you. He's in love with you, right? I want you to think that right now. Like he's in love with me, the real me. The, without the talent. Without the money, without the reason, just me. That's, that's who he loves. Because we hear that chatterbox, right? You better put on that mask. As soon as you go into the door, stressed, about to lose it. Hey, how you doing? How was your, how was your week? Oh, it, was, it was great. I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. You know, like I'm just talking to Jesus all night long. Like, we got to be real. Last thing. If you're a history guy or girl, you'll know, uh, remember Ivan the Great. And there was a lot of Ivans. And I don't know how you get the name the Great, but that would just be really great suffix for me. Just Joshua the Great. Amen? I mean, I'm just kidding. He was brilliant. He's from Moscow, military leader. 
quick decision making, right decision making. Sometimes you make a quick decision, it's the wrong thing. I mean, he was just known for being just a, that strategic leader in, in his group and in his troops. Well, he was so busy with just making investments and, and growing things and, and, and trying to run Moscow. And he's trying to partner with different uh, leaders throughout the world. And it just all that stuff back then, just territory and land and, and troops. I mean, it was power, right? Um, but he didn't have time for a family. Well, his team noticed that, uh, hey, Ivan, Sir Ivan, you have forgotten. You've done really great things, but you've forgotten uh, to have a family because you need a son to carry on your legacy. He's like, I guess you're right. I've been so busy just making investments and in all those things. So his advisors and, and his team and leadership there, higher-ups, they go and find a beautiful wife. I mean, the, the prettiest girl that you can imagine. She's the daughter of the king of Greece. He's like, I always love olive skin, you know. And he's like, this is going to be great. And uh, so they said, find him a beautiful wife and the king of Greece. And he's like, it's not just about my wife. Uh, this would align me politically. <laughs> like, this would be really great. Then I'd have power from the north, too. I'd have some, some aid and some assistance there. And Ivan is so excited because uh, this would align him. But the daughter of the king of Greece, uh, her, her dad, the, the king of Greece, said, Ivan, love you, dude. This is my translation. But uh, if you're going to marry my daughter, you've got to get baptized and you've got to convert to the Greek, uh, Greek Orthodox Church and, and be knowledgeable in the catechism. He thought about it. He's like, ah, sure, right? Like, the risk is worth the reward. He's like, okay, whatever. Fake it till you make it. Like, do whatever. Yeah, sure, I, I would do it. But no, he, he did have a kind of a serious heart on it. So the king of Greece dispatched a priest to go to Moscow to train him up in the catechism and train him up in the Greek Orthodox Church. Record time. I mean, record time that he was able to do this. But there was going to be a wedding later, but there had to be a baptism first. And uh, so, so he, he's getting trained up in all those things, and then he heads out uh, to Greece. I mean, long distance, long journey, long travel. He brings 500, like what a power move. Brings 500, 500 of his finest soldiers. They're dressed out. They're decked out. And they've got this thing on their, their arm. And they've got their swords in their hands. And they've got, you know, just their boots on, their, their, their bootstrap. They're, they're just like ready for battle, it looks like. Power move. Well, the troops, they're so loyal to Ivan that they're like, Sir Ivan, um, you know, they find out what he's doing. Like, that he's going to get baptized. Just so. And they're like, they were so uh, in wonder about that and just feel so appreciated that, man, this is going to line us politically too because if he wins, we win too. And Sir Ivan, we'll get baptized too. This is true story, like on the History Channel. You can look it up afterwards. So you have 500 soldiers decked out with their swords, with their knives, with their daggers, with their weaponry. I mean, like, decked out. You've got all these priests in there. They would have wore a black robe with a big funny hat, and it, it was great, you know. And, and he's got his sparkly stuff on, and he's just, his whole attire. And uh, so the troops are there. They're waiting by, by the sea, and the priests come, and they're doing like a crash course on the catechism and the Greek church. Don't lose me. And then, and then at that point, all these priests that have come from Greece realize we can't baptize those, those warriors, and they go to the king of Greece. Hey, did you know that we were going to be baptizing warriors? So he's like, hey, wait a minute. And, and then Ivan starts to get scared. And he's like, okay, well, let's, let's come up with a plan. So he's a strategic leader. He, he's trying to, you know, this investment politically align him, all those things. And then you have the poor girl that's over there that's like stuck in the middle. And she's like, what do I do? So they come up with a, a decision. You know, they made a decision, a compromise. And uh, so you've got, you've got these, these soldiers, these warriors and they've got their swords in their hands. And they're, and they're ready to go. And, and they're strapped and just looking so, I mean, just military, just lined up and all those things. And the priests, this was the agreement that was made. The priest would, would take each soldier, this warrior, and as he dunked him into the water, they extended their arms like this. Their fighting arm, representing their power, their strength. That they hold that sword up in the air. And as the priest dunked them, everything went into the water 
except their fighting arm and their sword. And it's this power, it's historical fact. It's this, it's this moving moment where the soldier has decided and, and Ivan has decided we'll be mostly converted. We'll be mostly baptized. And 500 of those soldiers, boom, every single one of them going down, holding their sword in the air. I mention that because what are you holding out of the air? What are you holding on to while you're going under the water? God's trying to bring in revival. God's trying to do great things. And you're like, I'll give you everything except my schedule. Boom. I'll do that. I'll give you everything except for my credit card. Baptized. Like, I'll be mostly saved. I'll be mostly converted. God, I'll do whatever you want to do. I'll serve on a surf team. I'll do that. But I won't, you, I won't give you that website. I won't give you that relationship. I won't give you that thing that I do on the side. I won't give you the alcohol. I I won't give you the drugs. I won't give you all those things. My spending habits, all of those things, the way that I talk to my wife, the way that I'm raising my family, I'll do it all, but except that one thing. And they baptized 500 of those soldiers. Wow. Three, if we're going to ride the wave of revival, we got to go all in. All in, church. God didn't hold anything back from us when he died for us on the cross. So why are we now? We're, we're just going to shorthand God. God, thank you for your blessings and your love and your mercy. But that one thing, I can't give you that. I can't. What is it that you're holding on to? Look at what Psalm 36, 5 through 6 says. This is in the message version. So I've done NIV, I've done message, I've done KJV. I've covered everybody, everybody's happy, right? Open up before God. Keep nothing back. He'll do whatever needs to be done. He'll validate your life in the clear light of day and stamp you with approval at high noon. That's the God that we serve. I'm so thankful that God, when he was on the cross, thinking of me, he wasn't going, well, that one thing, though, man, he gave it all, didn't he? Hands stretched wide. On the, the skull of Golgotha, he's standing there naked and afraid. His disciples have left. We got to go all in. In his heyday, Henry Ford and his team this is going to give you a little picture on why we do what we do, why we keep things. Henry Ford and his team came out with the first production car made in the USA, the Model T. Though it was considered uh, luxury, uh, it lacked many basic features such as side windows and standard brakes. It's a four-cylinder engine only uh, giving it 20 horsepower. And it came with a hand crank. <laughs> I don't even know what that is really, but it made the car go. <laughs> And it came in one color, black. 20 years later, Ford released the Model A. Had more accessories, came in more colors, and came with more options like the sedan, the convertible, the coupe, and even a truck. And so it was, the American consumer expected more. Today, when ordering a cup of coffee, man, choices are endless. When I pull up, and if my wife wants coffee, I better yell into that window, Grande matcha lemonade with dragon fruit juice as a base. And if they don't have matcha, they better get the, the mocha cookie crumble or the java. You can get all sorts of stuff. You guys like coffee, right? They'll get all jacked up on coffee, ready to praise the Lord in here. Look, choices are endless. Hot, ice, cold brew, 2% milk, decaf, regular, tall, grande, medium, bold, you name it. It's like McDonald's. We can just have it our way. And we do the same thing, don't we? We grab our stuff, and I'm just going to have it my way. Boom. And God, God baptizes us. We think we can have it our way. One day, a group of scientists got together and decided that humanity had come a long way and no longer needed God. And they said, God, we've decided we no longer need you. God listened patiently, then said, very well. Before I go, let's say we have a human-making contest. 
The scientist replied, we can handle that. But God added, but we're going to do this like we did in the old days with Adam and Eve. The scientist replied, sure, no problem. And bent down and started to pick up a handful of dirt. And God wagged his finger like this right here. He said, get your own dirt. <laughs> we don't think we need God. We think we can have it our way. And we don't think we need God anymore. Let's stand to our feet. The other day we're outside and kids are coming from everywhere. I'm telling you what, I can't speak for this congregation right here, but our youth ministry, I feel like it's been growing. We had almost 500 people here on Sunday morning. That was awesome. I told my wife, I was like, this, this is one of the best Easter services I feel like we've ever had here. Maybe I'm just more appreciative because I remember a time when Pastor Brian was preaching his heart out to a blue dot. And look at us now. Can we say, take that, Satan? Like God is bringing in a, a, a wave of revival. God is healing his church. God is cleansing the nation. And man, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. Wow. That verse that says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will rise up a standard. I used to say, you know, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he's like a flood. But where's the comma at? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will rise up a standard. Who's stronger here? God and the devil, if there's any competition, to be like me arm wrestling Savannah. I mean, come on. Poor Savannah. I've been throwing my kids all over the bus on Facebook. But look, the other day there was this kid who was coming in on his bike from Maryland Oats. And we've been trying to win that community for a while. And I feel like God's been giving us access. And we've got some things planned. It's, it's going to be awesome. And uh, Pastor Brian's been leading and, and, and just doing a great job with that. And Bo. And uh, this kid was leaving. And I mean, we got a dunk tank. I mean, we got a dunk tank. We got a bungee cords and all store. We, we got color war. We got all this. I'm like, if you leave, then there's nothing for you here. <laughs> You know, God's moving. And I said, where are you going? He says, I'm going back to get more friends because this is really cool. And I'm not kidding you. That kid rode his bike back and forth to Maryland Oaks, and there'd be like a wave of kids just coming over. Can I just say that God is moving in our community, that God is healing our church. God is doing something great amongst our mix. Can we lift our hands to God? Can we just say, God, fill us today. Fill us with anointing. Fill us with your power. Oh, Lord, there's not a part of our day that we don't want you in it, Jesus. God, we fix our eyes on you. Let's fix our eyes right here. Lord, we give you our eyes. Oh, Lord, we lift our eyes into the hills. Where does our help come from? The maker of heaven and earth. Oh, Lord, let us stop pretending. Let us stop playing games. Let us not put on the mask of church. Let us not mask. Lord, let us be like Paul on the road to Damascus. God, will you demask us, God? Will you do something powerful? Will you do something uh, uh, anointed? God, we approve. We welcome everything from your presence. Come on, let's pray, church. Let's pray right now. Lord, we believe that the prodigal son will return. We believe, God, that the doctor's uh, uh, report, Lord, there's another report we need to hear, God. We pray, Lord, over cancer. God, we pray, Lord, over marital issues. God, we want our church to be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit today. God, we give you that. Let's go into a song of worship. Let's give him praise. Lord, we love you.